G'day, g'day, Clayton here from XY Advisor, myself and Ray Jaramus, multiple award-winning Ray Jaramus, uh, interviewed Donald Griffin, our resident legal expert. He's actually got a course on xyadvisor.com. Go check that out now. Donald's really knowledgeable, really, really knowledgeable in this space, especially on trusts. So we spend quite a fair bit of time sort of talking about the complexities there and about deeds and about case studies and yeah a bunch of stuff on uh on how to use them best as a financial planner and how to really sort of start impressing your clients by by getting a little bit of knowledge and building up over time so yeah hopefully you enjoy this episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Does a binding financial agreement help at all for anyone? (laughs) Wow, straight into the hard questions. Uh, (laughs) I thought this was a chat chat. Um, Look, Clay may or may not be getting married next month. (laughs) (laughs) And and it's my fiancé asking me. (laughs) So this question is loaded. Okay, there'll at least be an audience of one for the answer of this. Well, just between us. Yes. It depends if you have the money, whether you're the person with the money or not. Um, They've dropped the word binding from binding financial agreement. So now they're just called financial agreements, which, which would give you the uh, the sense that maybe they're not a hundred percent binding anymore. They're definitely persuasive and helpful, and they can be binding. What happens is there was a high court case late last year where one was knocked down uh, and and found to be not enforceable, and that was because of the circumstances rather than the document. No way, the circumstances of the breakup circumstances of the getting the document signed i right. uh, undue influence ah so if you if you're just too cute about it and just kind of slide it across the table and say look just please sign here it'll all be fine um and there's no genuine negotiation mm. uh, and the other person can always say later on well i felt like either i signed it or the marriage was off mm. um it makes it easy for a lawyer later on to say, well, it sounds like there was undue influence at play. Because right. the circumstances of the breakup don't come into no, well, judgment it, at all, do they? No, well, it's a, it's a no-fault system in Australia, which which means that if one person's uh, been playing away or, you know, being you know, obnoxious in one way or the other, it shouldn't affect things. But within the agreement, the agreement, it could say, um, you know, if the... Uh, property settlement and divorce is initiated by one party rather than another, the consequences are ABC. Oh, right. So, yeah. So, so, so you can actually put fault in a, in, a, in a financial agreement. Essentially, you can, yeah, you can contract, uh, you can yeah, contract whatever you want. <laughs> really? And, yes. and, and the family court is willing to, to look at it quite persuasively. Yeah. Look, uh, where they're hard, where they're hard to um, hold on to is where circumstances have changed dramatically, and the, the the most obvious one of those is where you've got two youngish people earning good money, they agree some kind of split, and then fast forward fifteen years, one of those people has maybe taken time out of the workforce to look after kids, yeah, uh, and the other maybe has gone on to create a business or or draw a, a, a very good salary, and maybe the other one who's been left behind, maybe that partner can't get back into the workforce at the same level. Absolutely. So the court, the court ultimately has a jurisdiction to come up with a decision that's just and equitable. So. Um, uh, you know, it, it will take all, all factors into account. So we don't want to act in scenarios where people say, look, I've got all this money. He or she has, has nothing. It needs to stay that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we do say to people is, look, particularly if they've got rela- kids from a previous relationship, um, we can say, look, you, family law is a nightmare. You've got a previous relationship. You've probably got some experience about this. Next time around, you might want to say, well, look, our prior 
priority is our, our own particular kids. Let's save ourselves three years of legal fees and, uh, you know, therapy and the, the recovery of it uh, and just agree what, what we think is fair. Um, that can work very well. So this is the stuff that keeps you busy Monday to Friday? Yeah, we've got all sorts of things. Um, uh, you know, we do boring stuff like tax rulings um, and then we get random things like um, people crashing their yachts on the harbour um, or having, having hurt somebody or criminal issues. Um, people looking at trust deeds mm. uh, and, and for the first time tweaking them to, you know, uh, helping a couple with an adoption process um, uh, where you normally don't have lawyers and, and adoption agencies just take control of it. And they're saying, well, um, you know, what, what are our rights? Uh, and, I, you know, I didn't know the answer to that, but I found out the answer. They were very pleased. They said, oh, look, they've been asking around. And, and I was literally the only person who was able to answer their question. So there's weird, weird arse kind of areas. Mm. Um, but look, our position is to be the trusted legal advisor to families who are doing interesting things, um, either sometimes to each other, <laughs> hopefully with each other. <laughs> uh, so yeah, every, every look every every week is uh, a little bit different. Something really interesting on trust deeds um, is there the the digital signature laws don't apply. Mm. Right, and so I think in the legislation it, it can be written on paper or or, or leather parchment or some some crazy. I love right. those little legacy yeah, elements about yeah. law. And and, and yet uh, <laughs> uh, an uncomfortably high portion of SMSFs have their trust deeds digital. Right. Okay. So now you're left in a situation where your trust deed of your SMSF. Is dun, da, 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 invalid. Mm. So that that's it's an uncomfortable. Really? Tr- really? Yes. No. 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 I've like super looked into this. Super. Super looked, in, super looked into. Yeah. It. You like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have have you, has anything like that come across your desk? I, I haven't seen that one. Look, there's a very famous uh, trust law case called Kennan and Spry, uh, where uh, Doctor Spry uh, was and is an expert in trust law, and one of the. Um, uh, positions he took in 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 a very high profile case was that he had an oral trust. So you know, really, at legally, um, you could Whoa. have you could have a trust that is not in writing. Now it doesn't help you um, if you're trying to enforce Whoa. the provisions of that, and and it asks more questions um, than it answers, and it didn't really work out for him. You know, overall at the the end of the, those cases, which ended up in some criminal cases. So, look, you, you do these things for some certainty. Um, uh, we say, you know, the online things are, are great for certain things, but, you know, will the provider of those on, online services be around? Will they stand over their documents? So sometimes old-fashioned schlepping into somebody's office, yeah. and, you know, taking out the pen, Sometimes that's uh, that, that that's probably better from an advisor's point of view to have somebody a uh, relationship w- uh, mm. with somebody like that. I, I would be, and of course it serves me to say that, but that's kind of our pitch. That's our positioning rather than uh, producing um, or enabling the production of thousands of documents all around the country where there's no kind of real personal connection. But mm-hmm. those guys, there's a few providers, and I'm sure they've got some uh, good answers for for those kind of questions and, and, and service. The protection thing's kind of interesting because that falls into a space that we, we sort of touch quite a lot as financial advisors. But I, I just wonder, and I would suspect that all too often we would see trust set up where you've got the trustees and the beneficiaries and the settlers and the appointers being the same people the whole way through, which I would suggest kind of destroys the reason why trust exists because we're seeing more and more that you know the the courts are you know cutting through that entity aren't they if, if piercing the veil that's they? right yeah. good good expression yeah 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 we are seeing a lot of that and look 95 percent of uh cases um that's a, a figure i've pulled out of my <laughs> uh, back pocket <laughs> i'd say it's probably higher um have mom and dad or mom or dad or whoever it is the client in the key role as a point or controlling the trustee and yeah. as the primary beneficiary. And that's all fine, you know, or at least it was fine. 
Um, but if you, and I appreciate the context of these trusts, people, you know, they, they set them up very quickly. They don't want to spend much money. Um, there's usually a property or something that's far more interesting being acquired and it's just this is just paperwork. Uh, but in the cold light of day, if you and I do sit with them and say, right, well, you understand that this is the person who's controlling this. And they ultimately we find that the trust is not very strong for asset protection purposes. Mm. The money's come in, been put into the trust by that mum or dad as well. So, you know, it's very easy to pierce the corporate veil, as you say, Clayton. Um, the other thing we're, 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 we're seeing is um, second wives or second husbands being horrified to see that within the beneficiaries, the, the ex-spouse is, is still in there. Whoa. And, and often they're, you know, a matter, I was talking to an accountant today about um, the ex-wife is a co-appointor. Right. What so, the hell? Yeah. So, you know, on a, on a sunny day when everything's good, you know, yeah. people, decisions are made and then just totally forgotten about. So um, it's it's worth getting those roles right. If, if you're going to put somebody in as an appointor who's not you, you might ask them to sign a resignation letter at the same time. And, and what is an appointor for those that are kind of looking at Playing this space? Playing at home. Yeah. Sure. So an app- appointor is the person usually who can appoint and remove the trustee. So they're God, if you like, in terms of the they control the trust. Sometimes in the trust deed, it will say that certain decisions have to be made with their consent. So, you know, their role may be beyond just appointing and removing the trustee. It might be a veto over changing the terms of the trust or making certain types of distributions. So whoever you put in there, you need to have an exit plan. Uh, And we're seeing, so if I see a client and they say, oh, okay, well, what now? I mean, I'm the appointor. Um, I would say, well, if your kids are over 18, you might want to start appointing them and truly make a family trust an intergenerational structure. Mm. Okay, so the children as the appointor? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, and that's helpful for everybody because then they can say for, you know, a, a long period of time, there's been multiple decision makers in relation to this. Can the appointor not look mm. at the beneficiary as well? Or are they kind of fixed? Because I imagine if you're a beneficiary of a trust and a claim's have been made against you, then that's kind of the time where you might want to remove yourself from that entity? <laughs> Yeah, uh, the appointor doesn't usually have a role in terms of beneficiary uh, directly. They do indirectly because usually the trustee will say the trustee can expand or reduce the the class of beneficiaries. Right, so there's a link. Yeah, so, um, but look, it's a bit late when there's trouble to be removing beneficiaries. It's, It's better that it be a clean skin structure. So sometimes with people, I just say, well, look, you can amend it. Or you might want to have a new structure um, and put cash into the new structure. So from day one, the cash has come from your wife uh, rather than from you, which is really reasonably easy to, to facilitate. And the wife, for instance, was the appointor. So at least, um, you know, from day one, that, that structure hopefully is... is, is um, stronger than the previous one. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and once you start changing things, well, then... There's a line in the sand and you can, you know, follow the, 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 the history to see, well, who changed it. So, mm. so I mean, it feels like a bit, not a minefield, but it feels like something that I think advisors should probably look at. But if you get it wrong, this, you know, you're putting yourself at a bit of risk and your clients, right? So you, you would mm. you kind of be of the mindset that advisors should be looking at this sort of stuff and spending more time or really kind of maybe taking a step back and saying, no, 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 we do the behavioral stuff, the cash flow, the investments, and the entity is really pushed away to the accountant or the lawyer. Look, the um, the advisors that I see who have the strongest practices tend to look at this stuff um, because it gives them more things to talk about. And especially if you're, if you're stepping away from the investments, well, then it's, well, what else am I going to talk about? And, and you know, really, we see ourselves as part of the financial um, services community, really. Um, but it's, it's about goals and then it's about strategies. And you can bet your backside that not many of your competition are doing it. Um, and once you've done it a few times, you look at a trust, you know, for you to say to a potential client or an existing client, oh, I've looked at page 32 of your trust deed and I'm telling you stuff you don't know. 
they're usually reasonably impressed. Mm. I think it shows a, an attention to detail. You make it clear you're not giving legal advice. But once you've done it a few times, then you're able to say, look, I've in my previous experience is you being the appointor has certain consequences. I believe it can be fixed. Mm. You know, I can believe it can be changed. Um, so it's up to you. I mean, if you're not going to go there, I would advocate that you uh, clearly limit your scope and you make it very clear in your contractual documents. We will not be look, looking at, at legal advi- legal documents and we don't give legal advice and all of that. But if you do want to play in the area, you know, it's a real uh, differentiator between you and, and maybe somebody else who's competing for the business. Um, mm, mm. And also, um, you know, you it's a way of removing a problematic accountant or or building your relationship with the accountant, so for instance. So you could say, <laughs> listen, <laughs> the, the accountant set this up. That's your opportunity to go to the accountant and say, look, um, I want to work with you on this. Um, but I gather that that's not the most sophisticated structure. Do you want to now say to the client or will we say to the client? That was then, this is now. Um, or you can use it as a way to say, look, that guy maybe isn't, he he, he, uh, he or she could have given you maybe a bit more sophisticated advice on this. I've got a guy who can do it and, and off you go. Because as you know, sometimes, you know, advisors competing um, or you know, it, not not in the same area, but an accountant can be a problem, for mm, instance. Mm. Yeah, testamentary trusts. Um, I've 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 worked, I've worked in in personal finance for about ten years. I've never come across one. Mm, Holy like, moly! Like like as in as in one that was distributing funds that was active. Yeah, yeah I've mm. never come across it. Donald's done one for us. Really? Are you dead? No, <laughs> I, I actually VR is amazing. This isn't it? explains <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah. Donald's all over this. Yeah, yeah. look, we love them. Uh, they are good structures. There's great you know, tax efficiencies. Once people see, you know, they really they they thank the person who who has set it up essentially because you can look the the beneficiaries in the eye and say this is actually the most tax efficient structure uh, you can have. Uh, this is like, you know, um, well, I guess supers, supers, very tax e- efficient. Yeah. Um, but this is like a super fund that you can access when you're 18. Yeah, um, that's great. So, and grandparents like the idea because essentially very quickly you're starting to distribute money to grandchildren. And then uh, you're saying, right, well, the money's, what are you going to use it for? Maybe it's school fees, uh, lifestyle. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, it, it's a beautiful thing once it starts distributing money. Um, there's a few 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 mistakes people make in relation to. Sometimes they think, oh, it's got uh, excessive asset protection. If the structure's not right, it, it might not be as strong as it could be. But um, yeah, we say to people, look, you can have your cake and eat it. Uh, for example, you know, it's the largest lump sum most people are going to get is an inheritance. Um, Using an example of, say, 500 grand in a testamentary trust, you either invest it and have tax advantages or the other more common one is, look, well, I've got a mortgage of 500 grand. Shouldn't I just pay off the mortgage? Um, I know from my previous life that uh, paying off non-deductible debt is a good idea. But if you've got a trust, testamentary trust, you can essentially borrow from your testamentary trust, pay off the bank, and if a trust is lending 500 grand, it's acting like a bank. So you'd basically just swap the mortgage to the CBA with a mortgage to the trust. Mm-hmm. So essentially the balance sheet of child is um, real estate uh, and still they still have a mortgage. And if and at that, at that time, they can even negotiate with their spouse and say, listen, mom and dad have left me this money. We can pay off uh, the mortgage, but my advice from my advisors is that we do that as a loan. Um, how, how does that sound? It'll be interest free. Um, and at that stage, you know, the, the child can negotiate something with the spouse to say, well, look, I'm prepared to use my entire inheritance to pay off this mortgage to the bank. Um, but you've got to agree that you won't make any claim against it. Um, because it's, it's clearly set up for me and our children. 
and while you're um you know on good terms you you can enjoy living in a house where no interest is being paid and um, we don't have that fear of the of interest rates going up etc cetera, etc cetera. so it mm. works pretty well that's it. I think that's exactly why my fiance wants that uh, financial agreement. <laughs> <laughs> In my experience, it's the grandparents really loving the the facility or, or what that what that affords for the grandkids. You know, it's um, often and, and I think as people start to live a little older as well, they they you know they're especially a lot of my clients are still around at a time where their children are financially independent and you know they're kind of it's more the next the next step. Um, so. You know, talking things like tax-free uh, school fees and those sorts of things yeah, because wow. minors access adult tax rates and all that sort of stuff. Can can you put uh, unique terms within this testamentary trust, such as uh, let, let's let's fast forward fifty years from now? We're all hanging out on the porch and we're all you know we're about to keel over, and we've we've all got a testamentary trust, but we've got a we've got a twenty-one-year-old, you know grand son and uh and we say oh, you know you need to clip over the shoulders or whatever right <laughs> and you, and you don't, i don't want to i don't want to give you all this money it, can you have in the testamentary trust things like uh this 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 particular person needs to go and do university or can you put terms on it yes well look people have tried um and they usually fail um <laughs> They, in the olden days, it used to be uh, linked to religion. So it would be, you know, if you're practicing X and Y, you get the right. money. Um, they used to sometimes have provisions like if you challenge the will, you get nothing. Um, all of which the court have not been too sympathetic to because they go, look, um, that's against public policy. Uh, and one was tested recently in a case called Mead, which was the billion dollar case in WA. Um, Lang Hancock's business associate died, uh, Mr. Wright died with about a billion bucks and he had a child out of wedlock and he left three million in a trust for her. But from memory, he had provisions in the trust which said basically, you can have this money as long as you don't become a Buddhist. <laughs> don't. <laughs> it gets worse. Marry a Muslim um, <laughs> and various other things, right? So you can write, so that's the old guy on the porch going, right, telling his lawyer, you write this down, you know? And uh, people with funny names, you know, not to right, be involved. Right, so, um, right. anywho, the court found, we used the barrister who got the, got her 25 million initially, um, uh and he, he was able to persuade the court that, look, that was against public policy. People can't do that. Yeah, totally. Now, now you can do it during your life. Um, mm. You can set up trusts and have whatever provisions you want in there. Uh, the way to, to essentially achieve the same result is to control who the decision makers are and leave them some wishes um, mm. and their directions. And, and if they've got no skin in the game, they might be happy to carry out the dirty work of of the person. It's a memorandum of understanding. Yeah, I mean, memorandum of wishes. Wishes, yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah, but essentially if you put it in a, in a will-style document, then they're able to challenge it on the basis that really it's not, the money's not really there for them. There's a risk that they might not get it as well. Mm. And why should they have to jump through these particular hoops in order to get it? So, look, you can create your own adventure um, <laughs> in different ways. I mean, I've got a client who... Um, it's an investment banker. He's got lots of money and he went to private school in Sydney and his brother's up uh, on the coast somewhere. And he said, look, he'd have to, the kids would have to live with him, but I want them to go to the same school that I went to in Sydney. So how do we make this happen? And uh, so he essentially set up a trust and, and uh, blackmailed his brother and or at least he's going to reward him financially. <laughs> That's a better if, way of putting it. They, uh, yeah, yeah, if they, uh, Welcome if to they do certain things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. yeah. So, yeah, look, there's, way, there's ways to uh, achieve uh, certain things. Yeah. Now, um, a part of the reason why I've been pushing these controversial fringe topics is because you teach ethics mm. at uh, your son's primary school. So I thought I thought I thought that's quite an interesting. Uh, in, you know, you, you're a lawyer and, you, and you're teaching ethics. And um, if I learn anything from my CFP subject one, the ethics course, 
was that there is a deontology style of ethics, which is to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and then utilitarianism, the right thing to do for the most amount of people. So uh, I've got to ask, mate, are you a deontologist? <laughs> <laughs> or a utilitarian? <laughs> is, there only, is there only two options? Oh, I'm sure there's more. <laughs> oh, no, I'm my own style. Yeah, yeah. I'm an a la carte uh, ethicist. Um, look, my role is to follow the curriculum written by the St. James's Ethics Centre. So I'm not allowed to go in there. I've got my son here today who... who uh, He's quietly reading his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book, which very I'm cool very, book. very proud of. Um, but no, look, it's it's a course that's written by the St. James's Ethics Centre. It's uh, it's fantastic. It uh, basically explains to kids that everything's not black and white. Hmm. And it's been written by educationalists who understand, you know, the different stages kids are at. And it starts off very simply with, you know, analogies about cats and dogs and how they're different and you know sometimes they they, uh, they they get on well sometimes they don't then it's moving on to you know respecting other people's opinions and, and people's rights and so on and the beauty of it is they get to um, uh, hear from each other rather than just a teacher and the uh, kids who are quieter let's say get to hear their um, opinions respected just as much as the kids who are maybe a bit more confident and, and more usually the ones getting uh, questions right. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very subtle, but I recommend it. it's in public private, pl- pl- sorry, public schools in New South Wales only. And uh, very rewarding to for those who are interested in, in uh, who have kids to teach your own child um, and see them in, in action in the zoo. Yeah, my, my 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 stepfather taught us uh, our, our soccer team for a year. Um, then definitely throughout our whole history, that's probably the the closest that we ever became, or, or, or the most time that we ever spent together. And it was kind of cool seeing how people respected him. So it wasn't just our, our relationship; it was uh, me and my team, and collectively the respect. For my stepdad, and that was that was really cool. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. No, it's very look. It's very rewarding uh, uh, from the teacher's point of view, certainly. And uh, look, the kids have a good laugh. It's more relaxed than a normal class. They sit around in a circle and um, get to poke fun at me. So I think my son <laughs> enjoys uh, mocking me. Um, but anyway, we'll see. So, so is it through through hypotheticals, or what do they kind of? How do you teach uh, kids about ethics? <laughs> well. There's, um, you know, often there's a story. Um, recently, uh, there was a story about um, messages, um, the the Delphi Oracle, and uh, Ooh, so, that's that's Spartan, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, ancient Greece, and you know, there was this this person who you know essentially had uh, made statements, um, yeah. and whether they were going to be true or not, and then. You know, basically, we pointed out that by putting the comma in different places in, uh, of a say, a statement of of ten words, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something along along the lines of, um, go. It was a bit like Yoda, you know, go to battle, you will, and come back dead. <laughs> um, but if you put the comma in different places, uh, it had very different meanings. So that basically, the the, the subtext was, well, anybody who's telling you these kind of things, um is often being a little bit rubbery with the truth and you, and beware to take things at face value and yeah. things are cap- open to, to different meanings. A bit like a, a PDS or a prospectus, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, you, you, you moonlighted as a financial planner for a little while. Is that right? That's right. My therapist says I'm making good recovery. <laughs> um, keep taking the tablets. Uh, yeah, I did. And look, I really enjoyed it. I learned an awful lot. Um, I learned what a tough job it is. Mm. Uh, I did it during the GFC, um, Jesus. which was pretty pretty hairy, especially because I didn't know anything about investments and the markets were going crazy. Uh, mm. And that was back in the day, really, when a lot of advisors were purely <laughs> investment, you know, um I could just junkies. imagine you holding the graph 
but it's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at what we've been doing lately. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. the wrong way. To, uh, Oh. <laughs> no, I, that, I think I did do that. Yeah. Um, so, but look, it was really good. Get to understand uh, the dynamic, um, how processes, uh, the relationship, things that were very unlawyerly. Um, I remember going for a job as a financial planner and I, uh, I thought I did a good interview and uh, the recruiter phoned me up afterwards and said, you know, how do you think you went? And I was like, oh, yeah, actually pretty good. Uh, what was the feedback from them? And she said, well, they thought you were a bit lawyerly, actually. Okay. And I was like, oh, I thought I, you know, I thought that was what they wanted. And she goes, no, you, you know, really, you needed to bond with them and kind of win them over a little bit rather than just go, I'm the Oracle and I've got this great information. And if you if you pay me a fortune, I will release it to you. Hire me, you will. Yes. <laughs> 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 Start yeah. instructing on them on where to put the comma. <laughs> yeah. Clo- close, close the door after you. You will, they said. So, uh, so yeah, that was a very interesting experience for me. And uh, um, yeah, so you know, we bring it a little bit of that into how we practice, mm. and we want to know the big picture. And like I said earlier, you know, really, it's about the goal. So you know, I can assume that somebody wants one of my lovely documents, but actually. Their biggest concern might be to talk about a relationship problem or um, mm. or a business issue or something that you guys will talk to people about. Um, so we're, we're just a bit more careful. We try and find out who their advisors are, uh, if they have any. Um, if they don't have them, you know, we say, oh, you might want to get one. Um, particularly accountants, that's a really easy sell, you know, for people who do their own tax returns. I go, oh. Do you see a lot of that? Fair bit, yeah. yeah. Well, Especially okay. people who used to be accountants. Yeah, it's a bit like lawyers kind of doing their own wills. Mm. Um, you know, they kind of do it, and I say, uh, if you go to somebody, the fees are deductible, and they probably find something that you know will wash it away, wash it away, and and uh, and you know give you a bit more time. So sometimes, sometimes people are control freaks and they just want to do it themselves. But but look, we're believers in having a third party there to to bounce ideas off. Uh, I mean, I've got a financial advisor myself, and he helped us. We bought a property recently and he's talking to us about um, how quickly you pay it off. You know, mortgage brokers, funnily enough, don't do that. Mm. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, he knows what our goals are and talking about maybe buying an office or something. And do you give him lots of, of grief it. on the SOAs? <laughs> <laughs> He had a guilty laugh. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm 36. trying to figure out whether he'll be listening to this or not. Um, no, I'm I'm a very good client uh, and forgiving for commas being in the wrong place and full stops yeah. missing and so Just on. Just not yeah. extra zeros with commas. Next no, we watch out for that. And I do ask him, how much do you get paid for this? Good. Um, and I actually, I think I cancelled a trauma policy yesterday, which won't endear me to to your you didn't audience. You didn't even reduce the amount. Well, I tried to cancel it, of course. And then the guy said, oh, we can maybe reduce it to very little. Uh, we can't cancel it because there's some life, a life component. Yeah. Got very tricky. Yeah. Um, Kills step duty. And my mate, my mate said, uh, I said, how do I cancel it? He said, well, you can either phone up or we can do a statement of advice. To cancel? <laughs> to cancel it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, which I think was his subtle way of saying, please phone them and. You know, yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. want me to do a bloody statement of advice. That's ridiculous, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Jesus. See, I, I, I never sold much insurance as as an advisor. I, I, it wasn't really something that I enjoyed doing. It wasn't part of the job that I liked. But I'm actually a massive believer in it, and I and and I have it. So uh, for you to to be a hundred percent out of trauma, that's scary, isn't that scary? Well, the bloody cost was the scary thing, you know. <laughs> so maybe some of your listeners can can phone in and tell me they've got, <laughs> a, get got a great deal. <laughs> trauma quotes by the time you check yeah. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 30, you know, um, what is it, quotes? <laughs> yeah, there were, I mean, it was, it was like a 200 grand uh, cover and I think it was going to cost me over two grand. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, I was looking at one my... One and a hundred. My, mm. my, yeah, exactly. I thought, that's a bit cheeky. Give me another zero or something. You yeah. Know? Mm. Anyway, we'll see. Hopefully I'll be, touch what I'll be self-insuring for those kind of things before too long. So. Very good. <laughs> very good. Well, mate, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. 
for okay. those that are keen to maybe learn a little more or get in contact, what's your... Beyond beyond you having a course. Of course. On, Sorry, our, my mistake. on xyadvisor.com. So we just recently released a, a, a beta version uh, and you were one of our top four or five uh, courses. Founding, yeah. founding teachers. Absolutely. Yeah. So be, beyond, beyond that accolade, uh, where else can people find you? Um, well, look, we're really pleased to... to do that course um, and I think you know we in the course we um, we try and make it easy for people and encourage them to uh, get involved in this area and, and and hopefully there's some legal stuff but also just some practical things about how how to engage and, and make this part of your practice if you want it to be um, pretty you know you guys are emotionally intelligent uh, enough to be able to sell yourselves and your services so really a lot of it's actually small talk and just inquiring about people's families and comparing yourself with them and saying look I'm I also have a growing family or I have a business or whatever so yeah looking forward to all of that um look we're um we've got a website uh, legacylaw.com.au uh, we putting on some videos on that and um, we review all the cases so we, we published an article just recently on a situation where a carer, a lady worth about a million bucks, uh, had a cleaner who became her carer, who became her friend, um, who ended up getting the entire estate. Um, mm. Yes. So that's of, of interest to people, particularly if their parents are yeah. uh, getting older and maybe they've got it. Maybe maybe it's their brother or sister is the carer or maybe it's a third party. So you just need to be be careful out there and um, so yeah we, we publish articles from time to time we're on LinkedIn please please link in with me um, uh, yeah and look, how do you work with advisors um, look we really want to team with them and get them to if they don't want to go to meetings that's fine but I always encourage them to come to the meetings and um, I make a big point that the fees are lower because the advisors involved and information flow is happening and um, smoothly and, and efficiently um, but first point is, you know, give us a call, tell us your scenario, the client scenario, and, you know, we might even agree a, a fee on the phone so right. that, that you can then go back to the client and say, listen, this guy will do it for X or Y. Um, because I understand it is hard. People uh, don't want to just go and see a lawyer and expose themselves to the potential costs without having any idea. So we like to work with people like that. Um, and then over a over while, you know, we do fixed fees so that, you know, the advisors are able to say, look, this is what this is what you get and other people have done it. And, so and what, what, what's an average client look like or regular client? A regular client either has a business or um, some investable assets. Mm -hmm. So to be honest, if they've got a financial advisor and they're advising on assets and uh, not just insurance, um, they're probably a good client for for us. Yep. Uh, and what type of work? Super, well, we'd usually do. Uh, usually, they need a estate planning, so that'd be wills, testamentary trust, power of attorney, enduring guardian. Look at their super structure, superannuation, nominations. We talk about asset protection, so it might be well. Oh, okay. So you own this property. You know, you can transfer half of it to your wife, um, or de facto spouse, tax free. They kind of go, oh yeah, that might be a good idea. Given that you know, I want to have a business in my in the future, or I'm hoping to get promoted to a partner, or whatever. And how often would you see a client? Once every five years, once every year, once every ten years? What, what what's look probably on average once every five years. Once every five years. Yeah, but I always make a point at the end of it and say, listen, you know, you don't need to come and see me now, but you're you know, Ray or Clayton or whoever it is at the annual meeting with you will will realize that the moving parts are such that maybe we need to revisit the estate structure um, what I say to people is I like to give them some documents that will last 15 20 years so that you know it's only 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 uh, sub significant changes would would uh, require a redraft so yeah mm. I think one of the things that I've, I, especially with Donald, but I think a good lawyers do, they don't kind of accept orders. So if you send through a, a referral to get an estate plan done, it's not like, okay, well, this is the fee and this is what it is. And it's 
you know, bog standard. It's kind of like, all right, well, you sit down and Donald will go through a fact find process, ask questions that no one kind of really thought about through different sort of experiences and then sort of engineer a, a bespoke type of uh, proposal off the back of that. But I think it really bodes well for, for what I've done in the past on myself and I'm sure for other advisors when, when you kind of introduce someone into the mix who actually brings a, a different perspective and different ideas like that, the value that that, that comes through, that's you know, very material in my experience. Very good. Well, mate, I'm sure my fiance will be asking for your details within the week. And uh, <laughs> Well, if you're my client, I'll tell her that. Sorry, I can't act for her. But, uh, <laughs> smart. <laughs> Diplomatic as well. Mate, thank you very much for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you.